amen. What a great morning to start, right? Isn't that awesome? Let's give the Lord a huge hand for that. Worship, baptism, Lord's Supper, it really is an awesome morning. If you take your Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. Um, We're going to read in Genesis chapter 2, but it's really important that we see what's happening also in Genesis chapter 1. The Japanese, they have a saying, and the saying is karoshi. And this saying, it literally means overwork death. The medical term is occupational sudden mortality. And here's what it means, and the saying came from this, that there was this boom in the Japanese culture of work and the stock market and businesses and economic growth. And because of that, uh, people were working more and working more and working more. And people essentially became workaholics to the point that young people, even in their 20s, they would work so much that their stress levels would go up and their blood pressure would go up and their cholesterol would go up and their anxiety would go up. And it's a recipe for disaster. And some would die of overwork. Heart attack, stroke, suicide rates went up. And so this saying, Kiroshi began to move about the culture, this occupational sudden mortality. And I started to read and I started to look up and I actually found that the earliest um, um, case of this was a young woman who worked for a news outlet. And at one point, she had logged in over 150 hours of overtime. She was working that much. And in her late 20s, she died. Heart attack, stroke. Why? Overwork. As I started to look at this in context of the series that we're going to do today and and then next week, I started to do some more reading. And I came across an article called Overwork is an Epidemic. And within that article, I came across statistics noted from the International Labor Organization. And here are the statistics. Now consider what I just said about the culture in Japan and this saying, Kiroshi, overwork, death. Overwork, death. Death by overwork. Consider these truths even about our own culture. As Americans, we work 137 more hours per year than the Japanese. 260 more hours a year than the British. And listen to this, 499 more hours per year than the French, which means I'm moving to France, okay? (laughs) It's startling, right? The notion of being a workaholic, the notion of overworking. Some of you are resonating, some maybe not so much, but we get it, we understand it. Why? Because we live in a culture where our busyness is one of the marks that we matter, Our busyness is one of the marks that there is worth. It literally is code, this context of being busy. It's code for I am worth something. It's code for I am offering something. We actually love to respond to people when they say, how you doing? We really like saying, man, I'm just busy. We like it. We live in a culture that fosters it. As a matter of fact, technology, as it has grown, it's gotten better. Technology even allows us to take our hurry with us wherever we go. We put it in our pocket, and there it is. Statistics tell us that 75% of us sleep with it right next to our bed. Now, I actually believe that's higher. Some stats tell us that 90% of us, the moment we wake up, the very first thing we do is we reach over and we grab our hurry And we check our email, we check our text messages, we check our schedule, we get ready for the week, we get ready for the day. And so we live our lives in a hurry. But not only just our day-to-day lives, I would even argue that even when we go to play, we are in a hurry even when we play. You ever heard the phrase, I need a vacation from my vacation? It's true. Because sometimes we go on vacation, and it's not really rest, it's actually work. Listen, going to Disney with the family is not restful. It's fun, don't misunderstand me. It's not restful. Carrying all of your children's stuff down to the beach and holding one child and the other child left flip-flops in the condo and their feet are burning, that's not restful. 
as a matter of fact, the moment you start to rest, one shows up and says, I want nachos, right? I want to go to the pool. Whatever it might be. It's fun, but we tend to, even in our vacation, we tend to live in a hurry. As a matter of fact, I heard someone tell me once that if you want to do something poorly, you do it in a hurry. And the same thing is true when it comes to our lives. And the Bible actually has something to say about the hurried life. The Bible actually has something to say about the busyness of life. And it's something that we really need to pay attention to because our busyness and our hurry might be an indicator of something much deeper that we need to deal with. As a matter of fact, John Ortberg said this. He said, hurry is not about a disordered schedule. It's about a disordered heart. And so as Christians, we have to address this. As Christians, we have to figure out what does the Bible say about hurry? What does the Bible say about being busy? And how does it impact our spiritual life? Well, this morning, I think Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 and 3 is going to help us. And we're going to see a discipline that God has created for us that will help us slow down a bit. So Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, and by way of agreement that the Bible is sufficient and that it's true in all that it teaches, would you stand as we read God's word together? Here's what the text says. So the heavens and the earth and everything in them were completed, and on the seventh day God had completed his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done done. God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy, for on it he rested from all of his work of creation. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. We recognize that it's true and that it's sufficient. And God, may we take every word in your word as something to apply to our lives, to walk closer with you. God, we love you. We thank you for this gift. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, you can have a seat. God rested. This word rest is a Hebrew word, and it's the word where we get the word Sabbath. And here's what the word Sabbath literally means. It means to cease, and it means to stop. Now, I know this right now because some of you are already struggling with this. You're like, man, I ain't got time to stop. Well, I'm glad you're here. This is for you. Now, let me give you a definition of Sabbath. Here's a definition, a working definition of what Sabbath means. The Sabbath is a time set aside to imitate God's rest. That's really important. It's a time to set us, that we set aside to imitate God's rest, to stop, listen to this, to delight in his creation, to celebrate our time in his creation. And ultimately, to delight in God himself. And so when you take this definition, this definition isn't just about going on vacation. This, de this definition doesn't describe just someone who uh, you know, goes on vacation and just mentally checks out. No, the Sabbath is a very intentional time that Christians should observe. And it's a time, yes, to stop. What are we stopping from? The busyness and the hurriness of our life. We're stopping from the treadmill. We're getting off the sort of rat wheel waste. We're getting out of the game a little bit, and we're stopping, and we're taking a step back. And what are we doing? Well, we are imitating God's rest. We're delighting in God's creation. We're taking a step back. You ever, you know the phrase, uh, you know, you, you, if you go too fast, you, you need, sometimes you got to stop to smell the roses. You've heard that phrase? That's what this is. We're just taking a moment, we're looking out, and we are observing all that God has done. And not just looking at his physical creation, we're celebrating our time in this creation. That there are moments that we miss if we're just too hurried. So we're taking a step back and we're reflecting on our life and we're reflecting on where we are in his creation and what we're doing. And we're celebrating these moments that we get to experience this side of heaven. But ultimately, all of that to get us to this one point of Sabbath, to delight in him. But here's what I know. I know because we are so busy. 
I know because we live in a culture that values busyness. I know because we live in a culture where our busyness is tied to our worth, that it's code, that I matter. I know because that is true for many of us who would even label ourselves workaholics. And listen, being a workaholic is a, good, is, is a real thing, but it's not something we should celebrate. Because those things are true, here's what I know, is I know that for some of us, we need some sort of permission to get to this point of Sabbath. Like to really get to a place in life where we are, are, are practicing a rhythm of biblical rest, like we need, to, we need to have permission because we just can't do it. And so here's what I want to do, is I want to show you just a few things in God's Word, coming out of Genesis chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, and even all the way into Exodus chapter 20, I want to show you a few things that I think will help you get this permission that it's okay to rest. The first thing I want to point you to is this, is that rest is a part of the rhythm of creation. Now look at Genesis chapter 2. Now we know in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning God, what? Created. In Genesis chapter 1 and 2 gives us the narrative of God's creation. We know that God creates all things. He is the maker of all things. And in the midst of him creating all things, he also creates a rhythm for all of creation. And part of that rhythm we see is rest. Look at the text. On the seventh day, God had completed his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. Why is God resting? Well, we do know this. God is showing us what we need to, uh, what we need to um, imitate. He's displaying for us something that has to be a part, needs to be a part of the rhythm of our life. It's why God rested. Now, did God rest because he was tired? No. Did God rest because he needed to rest? No. Did God rest because as he was working and creating, he got blisters on his hands? He's like, I need some time to heal. No. God rested to show us a rhythm that he wants to be a part of our lives. And that rhythm is a rhythm of rest. It's ingrained into the fabric of creation. And so this resting, uh, that God is resting, as a matter of fact, when you read through it in the Hebrew sentence, it's, it's interesting because it's actually carrying the idea of God sort of taking a step back and enjoying his creation. Like he, he has created, and all that he has created is completed, and now he's stepping back and he's looking at this creation, and he is recognizing that it is good. And the best illustration that I can come up with is similar to after you finish mowing your yard. You know, I don't like to mow the yard. I, I really don't. As a matter of fact, I, I tell Katie even more recently, it's like when I'm done, I'm like, oh, I never want to do that again. But I, you know what? I do it again because the neighbors get mad if I don't, right? But when I'm done, I look back, I'm like, I can mow some yard. <laughs> I mean, the edging looks great, you know? Neighbors are jealous, I know they are. And you just, you just sort of enjoy it. And, and I think that's a picture. It's similar to like when you're in school, right? And you write a paper, and you finish that paper, and it's 100% your work. You didn't plagiarize nothing. It's all yours. And you turn it in, and you're like, it's finished. It's complete. And this picture is God taking a step back, and it's sort of a celebratory rest. It's a, it's, it's a response to this creation that he created. And if you'll notice, all through Genesis 1, all through Genesis 2, everything he creates and every day that he creates, he says it is good. And now it's complete and now it's all good. And so there's this rhythm that he shows us. He works for these six days and then he rests. It's a part of who we are. That when God made you and he created you, and this is pre-fall, so rest is not something that comes after the fall as a result of sin. This is something that was created into the fabric of creation before Adam and Eve sinned. And so we can now rest assured God has created us for this rest. We're made for that. 
I was thinking about this, and uh, I sort of, I'm, I'm tr- starting to get kind of in the mode where I'm like, you know, I need to get back in shape, you know? And I know y'all agree with that. I know you do. You don't have to flatter me. <sighs> anyway. <laughs> but uh, I'll be 44 in a couple of months. And I do know this, and I'm, not, I'm certainly not trying to make, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm old at all, okay? But I do know this, that some, some things have changed now that I'm almost 44. As a matter of fact, I even like bend over to pick up some trash and I can't walk for a week. I mean, I just get sore, you know what I mean? So it's time for me to get in shape, amen? Amen. So I get online, I'm like, all right, get in shape, men over 40, you know? And it's weird because I also notice, I'm like, God, I know I'm getting older because it takes a little longer to get to my birthday. You know, you got to scroll to your birth date on, the, on stuff. It's like 1977. Oh, my gosh. 70, oh, there it is. You know, it just takes a little longer than it did before. Okay. Three things. Three things that I found that men over 40 need to do to get in shape. You ready? Your mind's going to be blown by this. Number one, exercise. <laughs> I was hoping that was not on there. Number two, eat better. That's not fun. Number three, rest. Rest. And here's the truth. I don't care really how old you are. We were created for rest. We were made to take a step back. We were made to, uh, to, to look out. We were made to evaluate. We were, we were made to stop and to smell the roses. It's ingrained into the fabric of creation. We see this in God's example that he rested on the seventh day. And so if you're looking for permission, if you're looking for some like, I'm going to need some help with this because you just don't know how busy I am. I'm going to need some help with this because i got a company to run. I'm going to need some help with this because, you know, i got clients and I've got patients and I've got yards and I've got whatever it is. I've got a classroom to get ready for. I've got lesson plans to prepare. I've got lessons to teach, whatever it might be. If you need permission, you need to see God did it. We should as well. And so that's the first point is that it's, it's ingrained into the rhythm and the fabric of our creation. Number two, rest is blessed. God blesses rest. And if you'll notice in the creation account, God blesses three things. He blesses the animals. He creates them. He blesses them. And he tells them to be fruitful and, he, and to multiply. Then God creates man, and he says, be blessed, be fruitful, be mul- and multiply. And then God blesses a day. We see that in the text. God blessed the seventh day. Now, what is God doing when he blesses something? When God blesses something, he's making a proclamation that that thing, whatever it is, whether it be a person, whether it be an activity, or whether it be a day, he's making a proclamation that it glorifies him and it is good for you. And so if you need some permission to get into a rhythm of taking a Sabbath, we'll explain it more in a moment, well, it glorifies God and it's good for you. I read an article from Desiring God from Vanitha Reisner. Here's what she says. She says, Scripture shows that blessing is anything God gives that makes us fully satisfied in him. Anything that draws us closer to Jesus, anything that helps us relinquish the temporal and hold on more tightly to the eternal. And often it is the struggles and trials, the aching disappointments and the unfulfilled longings that best enable us to do that. You know what she just said? She said that you need to have a rhythm of Sabbath in your life because life gets lifey. Life gets lifey. And you can't avoid it. You can't get away from it. It's kind of like this pandemic thing. We just can't get away from this thing, right? Life is that way, and it's not going to change until Jesus comes back. And so God then models for us a rhythm of rest, of Sabbath, and the reality is is that we need it for our soul and for our spirit because life gets lifey, and we need intentional, intense moments of rest, of Sabbath in our lives to remind us of what's eternal so that we will reject what's temporal to give us happiness or satisfaction. It's like the the song says, the hymn says, that when we turn our eyes to, to God, 
God, to Jesus, the things of this world grow strangely dim. dim. That's what Sabbath does. It puts our eyes on what's going to matter 100 years. And 100 years from now, all that's going to matter is Jesus. Jesus. And so it's ingrained into the rhythm and the fabric of our creation and who we are. God blesses it in the text, which means it glorifies him and it's for our good. And so let me ask you this question. What could you do for a full day that would stir your affection for Jesus? What could you do? Think about that. Get your mind wandering there. How could you get to a place and what can you do that will stir you towards Christ? That's where you begin to build what Sabbath and what rest really looks like for you. Because the point is to stir you towards Christ. Number three, the permission, it's in the rhythm of our creation, right? God has blessed it, but also the text says that rest is holy, God blessed the seventh day, go to the text, and declared it holy, for on it he rested from all his work of creation. You know, the first time we see the word holy in the Bible, it's in the context of Sabbath. First time we see this word, it's in the context of a day. The first time we see this word, it's showing us that we can actually rest And have a Sabbath where we think upon God and we really don't have to go anywhere to do that. And and the notion of of God being everywhere, it really is foreign to all other faith systems. All other beliefs and ideologies, they put God in in a space. Like in order to really rest in God, in order to really experience God, in order to really reflect on God, well then you gotta go to this shrine you got to go to this temple. you got to go to this mountaintop. you got to go to this place. But what we're seeing here as God is making this holy is that in your rest and in your Sabbath, you are actually entering into the presence of God. It's a holy time because God is everywhere. And so you don't have to drive to a mountaintop. You don't have to go to a shrine. You don't have to enter into a temple to experience God, to be in relationship with God, to rest in God. And so as I'm I'm talking about this, it's really important that you see the difference between just sort of like, you know what, I am going to take a Sabbath. You know what, next week we're going on vacation. That's not what I'm talking about. Here's a quote that I read from, I don't remember where I read it, but it's, it's not mine, right? Biblical rest is not a day off, but a day of worship. You see, there's a difference between a day off and a day of worship. And we all need days off, don't we? Because we have stuff to do. We've got, you know, roofs to take care of and things to hang and leaks to fix and yards to mow. Like, we need those days for sure. But we also need a Sabbath. We need a day. We need a time blocked off to worship, to reflect, to think, to slow down to look at God's creation, to revel in our place in it and our time in it, but ultimately to delight in him. And so the permission that we get is that it's a rhythm that God displays for us in creation. It's a blessed thing. Rest is blessed. Rest is holy, but also rest is a command. Go to the right to the very next book in your Bible. Go to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, the nation of Israel, they're, uh, they're um, out of Egypt. They find themselves at the bottom of Mount Sinai. At the top of Mount Sinai, there is Moses, and God gives Moses a gift to give to the nation of Israel. It's called the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments are like baseline morality. The Ten Commandments still bind us even today. Like, they're, you know, you can't use the New Testament then say, you know what, I can murder now, finally. I can finally take what's not mine. Hey, I can finally have an affair. I mean, you just don't do those things, right? We, there's this baseline morality that continues to be uh, sort of marinated through the scriptures. 
And so we still had these commands on our life. And if you'll notice in Exodus chapter 20, verse 8, you'll see a familiar command that God has already displayed for us in Genesis chapter 1. Remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. You are to labor six days and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day to the Lord your God. You must not do any work. You, your son, your daughter, your male or female servant, your livestock and resident alien who is within the city gates. For the Lord made the heavens and the, and the earth and the sea and everything in it and in, in them in six days and he rested on the Sabbath day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and he declared it holy. Now, what's interesting here is it stirs up a lot of questions. We're going to answer those specific questions even next week because Jesus' encounter with the Pharisees, a lot of the times his encounter with the Pharisees was on the Sabbath. And there was this debate that went on and on and on about really what you can do on the Sabbath and what the purpose of the Sabbath is. And Jesus even engages in a really incredible dialogue with some Pharisees about who the Lord of the Sabbath really is and what you can do on the Sabbath. That you become this worshiper of a law and you've totally missed the point of the Sabbath. We'll talk about what rest for our soul means. And it's directly related to how this Exodus, uh, this command in Exodus chapter 20, one of the Ten Commandments, how does it impact us for today? But the point I want you to see here right now is that rest is the only spiritual discipline found in the Ten Commandments. It's the only thing that is something that should be a part of the rhythm of our life all the time. Rest. We are to still remember it. We're to still keep it holy. We're to, to be intentional about it. We're to take time to, to uh, imitate God's rest, to reflect on his creation, to reflect on our time in his creation. Remember, this is our definition of Sabbath. But ultimately, to delight in him. And so the permission that we get is what? It's, it's, the, it's a part of the rhythm of creation. Like God has given it to us. Rest is blessed. Rest is holy. Rest is a command. And finally, rest, it's a gift. He says, remember the Sabbath day. Remember it. Don't forget about a time to reflect on what God has done. Don't forget to build into the rhythm of your week to remember what God has done. And God's gift of remembrance to me is exactly that. It's a gift. God's gift of remembrance given to me and given to you. It's exactly that. It's a gift. A time for us to reflect on his goodness and his grace and his mercy, he's given us this gift of remembrance. We see this in baptism. We celebrated baptism this morning. What an incredible gift of God's salvation. Do you remember your baptism? Do you remember that moment where you're sitting in that water and that pastor, wherever you were, that friend, that dad, the person that led you to faith? Do you remember the symbolic truths that are displayed in baptism, that before you, are, before you are submerged into that water, immersed into that water, you are a sinner needing a Savior. But then you believed upon Jesus, you accepted his work for salvation, and then you become buried with Christ. You know why? Christ died. He rose again. And because he died and he rose again, that means salvation can be offered to you, which means you're going to die and you're going to rise again. Amen? You're buried with Christ, and then your ways to walk in a new life. It's overwhelming, God's salvation. And so he gives us this tangible, obedient thing to follow up with, to be reminded of the truth of salvation and what's happened to us. Then he gives us the Lord's Supper. We, we observe both ordinances today. Isn't that awesome? What does the Lord's Supper do? It reminds us and we remember as to how we can get to that point. And it's only through Christ. That we can't be buried with ourselves. We can't be buried with our works. We can't be buried with how much we gave to the church. We can't be buried with how good of a neighbor we were. We can't be buried with our deeds. We can only be buried with Christ to then be raised again. If you're banking on your works, 
then you're going to be buried and you're going to stay there. And so we're, we're reminded as to how we get to that point. And they're both gifts given to us. And you know, Sabbath is no different. The gift for us to sort of push back against the result of a fallen world. You know, being a workaholic is a result of a fallen world. We shouldn't celebrate it. I'm not saying don't work hard. But when you say you're a workaholic, you're saying that that's the most important thing in your life. You're saying that's where you get your fulfillment. You're saying that's where you get your worth. You're saying that's where you find peace. That's what your hope is in. You're saying that's what is going to sustain you and satisfy you. We shouldn't celebrate that. Sabbath is given to us to take a step back and to stop to reflect, to remember God and all of his splendor. And so here's the question. What's keeping you from rest? What's keeping you from Sabbath? What's keeping you for a time in your week that you set aside for you to reflect on God and who he's done, what he's done and worship him and thank him and to truly think upon your salvation. If you say, Brad, it's my work. We got to work through that. Brad, you just don't know my schedule, man. You just don't know what's on me. You don't know how busy things are. I get it. I really do. And here's all I can offer you in the moment is that if that's you and you would say, hey, I can't rest because look at my schedule. Well, I think that's a great time for you to employ wisdom from your brothers and sisters in Christ. We do that in every area of our life. We do it with our finances. We do it with our marriages. We do it with our children and our parenting. Well, let's do it with our rest. We want to help you. And so if that's you this morning, you go, look, and I, I get it. I want to get there. I just, I'm struggling to see how I can get that into my schedule. I got all this stuff. Oh, and plus I'm a dad. Oh, and plus I'm a wife. Oh, and plus I'm a parent. Plus I have kids. I mean, I get it. We got to help each other get there. And so if that's you, you're a follower of Jesus, you're going to look, I want to get there. I, I don't rest. I don't take any time for Sabbath. I don't really think about, you know, having an intentional, focused time where I just get alone with God. But I want to get there. I just need some help. And so if that's you this morning, just like we always do every week, and you'd like some help in this area, you got one of these Connect With Us cards that you've been holding on to, you put your information on the front, you write on the back, I need a pastor or minister to call me, we'll call you, and then we'll set up a time to start working through your schedule and your time. We'll talk more about Sabbath and what that means for you. And in just a moment, you can place them in one of those black boxes on your way out. For some of you, you're going, man, I can't rest because I don't know God. I don't even know if I believe in all this. And let me just say this. You'll never truly rest until you have believed and accepted the work of Jesus to save your soul. It'll be the main purpose of next week. The Sabbath that you really need is rest for your soul. And so you might say this morning, listen, there's no rest in my soul. I, I don't know what it is, but I'm just stirred all the time. And I'm trying to find something, and I just can't get there. I can't find peace. I can't find satisfaction. I've tried everything. Have you tried Jesus? I believe if you're here this morning and that's you, God has placed you in this building because he's got a divine appointment for you this morning. And that's to leave here by putting your faith, trust, and hope in Jesus. That's where real rest is found, and it can only be found in Christ. And so if that's you this morning, we want to help you with that. Yes, you can take one of these Connect With Us cards. You can write your name on the front. You can write on the back. I need a pastor or minister to call me. We'll call you, and we'll talk about your salvation. But listen, you do not have to wait. You can get the answers today, and you can make a decision, and you can decide, and you can answer the most important question a person will ever answer in their life, and it's what they believe about Jesus. And so if that's you this morning, fill out the card, put your information. When we're done in a moment, you can put the card in the black box. We'll, get, we'll call you ASAP. Or don't wait. You can get the answers today. In just a moment, I'm going to pray. We're going to respond in worship, which is always the appropriate response when we hear God's word. Christians, we're going to wrestle with this in our hearts and minds as to what this rest looks like. And we're going to take the appropriate steps to figure this out for us, engage in this discipline. 
And when we're done singing and worshiping, Don's going to come up. He'll give us some parting words. And then we're going to be dismissed to go about our day. And if you'd like to talk to someone about what it means to be a follower of Jesus, I'll be hanging around down front. I'd love to talk to you about the most important thing ever, and it's Jesus. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, we do love you. We thank you. God, we worship you, God, this morning. We respond by looking to you and singing to you and God in that way asking you to stir in our hearts and to peel back layers and to pierce us so that when we leave here God we'll, we're walking closer with you God I know this is not an easy subject because we, we, we naturally start to think of questions of like well how long and what day should it be and is it an hour is it 24 hours and God those are legitimate questions and so what I pray that, that we'll take steps towards answering those questions that we'll get help and we'll get people looking at our schedule. We'll get help from our spouse and our husbands and wives. We'll work together so that each other, their, their souls are, are fueled and filled and that there's Sabbath in their lives. God, I pray that every Christian in this room will see the importance of building this time into our lives and how good it is for us because it glorifies you. And God, if there's anyone here that doesn't know you as our Lord and personal Savior, they haven't believed and accepted the work of Jesus on the cross, but this morning something's stirring in them, Lord, I know that's the Holy Spirit. God, draw them unto yourself. May they not leave here today without doing something. God, we do love you. We do thank you. We worship you. And we thank you for the gift of rest to remember you. God, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand?